It was the 1st of September, 2004. For many of these kids, it was their first day of school. What started out as a day of great joy and excitement ended as one of the worst hostage tragedies in human history. Inside this gymnasium, more than 1,200 hostages were crowded together with explosives suspended above their heads. Three days later, over 300 hostages were killed, including 156 children. The terrorists were Muslims, and they carried out the attacks in the name of Islam. I'm also a Muslim, and I've dedicated my life to fighting the threat of radical Islam. How are you doing? Fine. Images demonstrate mild inferior uh, fixed defects in the inferior wall. My name is Zudi Jasser. I'm a doctor currently in private practice in Phoenix, Arizona. I was a lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy, and I served as a staff physician to members of the U.S. Congress and the Supreme Court. Thank you so much for coming. As a devout Muslim, I saw it as my responsibility to expose the radicals. I resented that they were exploiting the religion I love. If you listen to bin Laden, he is not a nutcase, as many Muslims will want you to believe. He is a fascistic theocrat, period. After 9-11, I started looking into what was driving radical Islam. I came across an alarming document that reveals the true agenda of much of the Muslim leadership here in America. It didn't take long after 9-11 until it was revealed that Muslims were behind the attacks. I had expected to see Muslims in America taking to the streets and protesting against bin Laden. Instead, in the years that followed, we saw many Muslim leaders standing up to defend or support the radicals. Stop calling them suicide bombers. They are not suicide bombers, they are heroes. And it's about time that we have an intifada in this country that changed fundamentally the political dynamics in here. So I formed my own organization and I protested. Where are the Muslims? Where are they in speaking out and condemning terrorism? Local Muslim leaders refused to participate in the rally. In fact, shortly afterwards, I was outcast by the Islamic leadership across the country. And there was even a cartoon published in a Muslim newspaper that portrayed me as a dog cannibalizing a religious leader. It wasn't until I saw this document written in America by American Muslims that I understood what was really going on, a strategy to infiltrate and dominate America. We all know about terrorism. This is the war you don't know about. I think there is a general tendency to underestimate the threat which is offered to us in the present global conflict. I think the public in America is denied the strategic truth Media and elite are not helping. The vast majority of Americans no longer are falling for the trick of the bad terrorists who are out there to get us. They are framing the debate as Iraq, or as Afghanistan, or as Guantanamo Bay. They're not showing the public the big picture. Jihad Muhammad 
It's an entire movement, and the idea of it is hatred for our way of life. The clash between Islam and Christendom has now been going on for more than 14 centuries since the advent of Islam. The first key point that Americans need to know is that this is a war, a jihadist war, which started before 9-11, before the end of the Cold War, before the beginning of the Arab-Israeli conflicts. It's a very long war with deep roots. This is a war about religion, not because we wish it to be so, but because the radical Islamists have named it so. This is a global cosmic struggle between two religiously defined civilizations, which will end only when they triumph universally. There were two major jihads in history. The first one was during the beginnings of the early Islamic empire. In the seventh century AD CE, Arab Muslim armies erupted from Arabia and conquered a lot of lands. When the Arabs came out of Arabia and moved into the Fertile Crescent, uh, eastwards to Iraq and Iran and Central Asia and India, westwards to Syria, Palestine, Egypt, North Africa, and from there into Europe, where they uh, ruled Spain and Portugal and a good part of Italy for quite a while. Um, that was obviously not done by peaceful persuasion. That was the first major jihad. The second jihad, when the Turks invaded the Balkans all the way to the walls of Vienna. They conquered the great Christian city of Constantinople in 1453, and they were able to expand into southeastern Europe, um, conquering the whole of the southeast. And where we find ourselves today, we're in the third and final phase of their mission to bring about the domination of their version of Islam. If one wants to find out what is motivating radical Islam, surely it's more sensible to look at what they actually say they're doing and what their intentions actually are. The main goal of our jihad and resistance is to implement the law of Allah and to fight against the infidels all over the world and implement one religion across the world. In the world's most populous Muslim nation, a call for Islamic law. So when we look at the conflicts in India, Chechnya, Gaza, Indonesia, Iraq, Somalia, and countless other countries, this is what's at the root, the quest for Islam to become the dominant religion and Sharia, the law of the land. It seems so preposterous and so unbelievable, but yet thousands and millions of people follow this and take it seriously. Isn't it time for the unbelievers to discard these incoherent, illogical beliefs, theories, and conjecture? Isn't it time for every Christian, Jew, pagan, and atheist to cast off the cloak of spiritual darkness which enshrouds them and emerge into the light of Islam? Have you ever stopped to think about what would happen if the Islamists won and their version of Sharia law was put into place? All you need to do is look at countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran, Sudan and Somalia and places like the Gaza Strip and you'll see that those places are human rights disasters.
Across the world, uh, we see that Christians are having a terrible time of it. Christians in Iraq are deliberately targeted. The past six months alone, seven priests have been kidnapped and two of them murdered. All kinds of countries, we see Christians being persecuted, being uh, oppressed, uh, their churches being burned down, uh, Christians being murdered, uh, sometimes in very large number. They were, they were in the church for prayer uh, when the car bomb went off. The Christian communities in most Muslim countries now clearly feel themselves to be under strain. And it's noticeable, for example, that a town like Bethlehem, which was once predominantly Christian, now has very few Christians remaining. Bethlehem is once a Christian city. But today, Christians are only about 10 to 15 percent of the population here. My father has been, been shot at three separate times for one separate reason, carrying that cross and walking every day. Where there are Christian minorities and where there are Jewish minorities in any one of the countries where there is an Islamic majority, they are persecuted, they are overtaxed, they have to hide their religion. In the Islamic countries, for Saudi Arabia, etc., propagation of any other religion is prohibited. Even construction of any place of worship is also prohibited. In the homeland of Islam, Saudi Arabia, the Vatican of Islam, you're not allowed to build a church and you're not allowed to carry a Bible. It's both an offense. And Allah Ta'ala said in Surah Imran Surah Number 3, Ayat Number 85, that there is no one in Islam that is not allowed to accept Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So in the context of the religion, we know that the Islam is only the one in Islam. That's why we don't allow propagation of the other religion. Look at the Taliban when they got into Afghanistan. They put out a fatwa to destroy the Buddha statues. that were there for hundreds of years and that were very valuable. The Islamo-fascists who are attacking the world want to impose their beliefs on the world. Not many people are aware of the fact that in Iran, you'll find the so-called modesty police patrolling the streets. If women are caught wearing the wrong clothing, they could be fined or even arrested. To women entering this shop in Tehran, a message saying all clothes sold here have been approved by the police. The length and size of coats Nothing too short, nothing too tight, and mostly in black. Women who shop here know there's no risk of getting a warning or being arrested for indecency. As a woman, if you, and all individuals are different, but if you are an individual woman with a strong character, and you rebel against this kind of life, you run, more than anyone else, the risk of being beaten. <laughs> Abused. Your spirit being killed by your own family, by your own loved ones. <laughs> هو لا شك أن الضرب هو يعتبر وسيلة من وسائل الإصلاح. قال لي أنا ما لي جاي أضربك أنا جاي أقتلك ومسك في رقبتي وسدحني على الأرض وبدأ يخنق فيها بنظرات يعني. But the issue of men controlling women's lives goes much deeper. 
it can even result in murder. Just another teenager with everything to live for, except that Heshu Yonez was trapped between two cultures when she began a relationship with a Christian Lebanese boy, her strict Kurdish Muslim father slit her throat. Chowdhury Rashid is charged with first-degree murder in the death over the weekend of his 25-year-old daughter, Sandila Kanwal. Based on what police say, this could be what's known as an honor killing, the murder of a woman, often by a family member, to punish her for shaming the family. According to the United Nations, some 5,000 women and girls are victims of so-called honor killings every year. Whether it's because they've been seen talking to a man, refusing an arranged marriage, or even suffering rape, they're murdered for one reason only. They're perceived to have brought shame on their family. And it's often the family that carries out the sentence. This is Aksa Parvez. Her father told authorities that he strangled her, allegedly, because she wouldn't wear a headscarf. We are bound by the rules. If a woman runs away, she must be killed. Good name is more important than the penalty. We don't care about the penalty. A good name is the most important thing in our world. Islam does not countenance honor killing, but has nevertheless become part of Islam as practiced in much of the Islamic world. It's not just women and children that are repressed in these countries. You would never want the government to find out you're gay. In a society where radical Islam rules, gays are seen to be people with a contagious disease, a very bad disease. Sometimes we are blunt. When the Islamic ruling system is established, like you said, we're gonna give them a choice. We're gonna consult them, give them choice of therapy, and tell them to abandon their homosexual lifestyle. And if they don't, either leave, or if you wanna be here, then we get, you're gonna be face a, pun, face a punishment as a criminal. What's the punishment? And, uh, throwing off a cliff when you have a homosexual uh, sodomy. <laughs> The faces of Iraq's persecuted gays are too many to show. They've been shot, burned alive. In some cases, their heads were severed. Here, a gay man being beaten to death. If you look at countries like Iran, they um, flog them and they hang them. And that's only because you're gay. In Iran, we don't have homosexuals like in your country. We don't have that in our country. City Muslim Day Parade is a perfect microcosm of Muslim representation in America. You had a majority of Muslims that were of all races, creeds, and heritage that were celebrating their country and uh, were clearly proud of being American. I live in America, I work in America, I sleep in America, I was born in America, I love this country. But unfortunately, there are also those Muslims that hold more radical views. Islam will dominate. That's what it will be. These groups are not Al-Qaeda, they're not Hamas, they're not Hezbollah, and most of them are nonviolent. But they still want to replace American law with their version of Sharia, Islamic law. 
we want to see Sharia here, and it will be. The flag of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, will be, inshallah, on the White House if that's what we choose to be. It just takes time. The American people are waking up now. Allah does say that the whole world eventually will be under his, his ruling. The world will come down to where everybody obeys uh, the laws of God. Simple as that. When groups like these talk about wanting to create a global Islamic state and Islam dominating the world, you realize that they hold some of the same goals as Al-Qaeda and millions of radicals around the world. And that's what makes them dangerous. There's no compulsion in Islam. That means we can't force it on you. But we will force Islamic Sharia, inshallah. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. There are over 1.3 billion adherents, and it's also thought to be the fastest growing religion in America. One of the most common questions I get when I speak to audiences around the country is, what percent of Muslims in America are radical? And the Pew poll in 2007 actually provided some staggering numbers about that. In a hair-raising number, the Pew Research Center reports on a new poll that as many as one in four young American Muslims condone suicide bombings against civilians, at least sometimes. Nearly 25% of Muslims, 25 under 30, found suicide bombings to defend their religion as acceptable. So you're talking about just about 200,000 folks who believe in uh, suicide bombing. What do you make of this, Steve? Well, I think the numbers are absolutely frightening. Unfortunately, the, the mainstreaming quotes, American Muslim leadership has been in denial. What's happening? Where's the disconnect? What, what's the influence there? The influence is basically political Islam, which is you have sermons that are not being given about the love of God. They're hearing about every plight to blame the West. And in exchange, they have nothing to offer other than hate. As we move further and further away from September 11, 2001, as we remain safe during that period, there are gonna be increasing number of people who either don't see the threat as clearly or their, their, their psych psychological makeup is going to want them to wish it away. It is definitely here. I don't want to overstate the problem, uh, but there is a danger of understating the problem of homegrown Islamist terrorism. And the fact is we have now had a series of cases that have thankfully been broken. But yes, seven people have been arrested in the Miami area. Officials say the plotters were in the early stages of planning an attack on the Sears Tower in Chicago. They hoped for their attacks to be, quote, just as good or greater than 9-11. Police arrested six men and charged them with planning to attack the Fort Dix Army base. This is a new kind of terrorism. It is not only coming from outside the United States in, but it is also growing inside our own country. Time magazine says Al-Qaeda was planning a cyanide attack, which could have killed thousands. From what I last heard, the U.S. government has stopped over 31 attacks against the U.S. since 9-11. These homegrown terrorists may prove to be as dangerous as groups like Al-Qaeda, if not more so. In today's context, there are actually two different types of jihad. There's the violent jihad, where the Islamists use violence and terror to try to overthrow their enemy. And then there's what has been termed the cultural jihad, where these Islamists use, in a most duplicitous way, the laws and the rights they are given in our society to try to uh, work against society and overthrow it. America needs to understand that the jihadist machine is already within the society. Americans are being told that many of the mainstream Muslim groups are also moderate, when in fact, if you look a little closer, you'll see a very different reality. One of their primary tactics is deception.
They present themselves as moderate leaders committed to peace and condemning terror. As Muslims, we want to state clearly that those who commit acts of terror in the name of Islam are betraying the teachings of the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad. But when asked about specific terrorist groups, CARE officials are either evasive or outright supportive. Does CARE have a position on Palestinian Islamic Jihad? We haven't published one. Now, don't, don't you okay. think that... Oh, you gotta go. They just lied about the terrorist organization. This is not a terrorist organization. And in 2000, Abdul Rahman al Amudi openly supported terrorist groups. Anybody is a supporter of Hamas here? Yeah. Hear that, Bill Clinton. We are all supporters of Hamas. Allahu Akbar. Anybody supports Hezbollah here? Takbir. But al Amudi went further than just cheering for these groups. In 2004, he was actually arrested on terror charges. Perhaps what made the Alamudi case so troubling was that he was considered by many in the media and government to be a moderate Muslim leader. And Alamudi isn't the only leader who's had a problem with the law. Many so-called moderate Muslim leaders have been convicted on terror-related charges. To be fair, on their website, CARE has condemned Al-Qaeda by name. But why won't they condemn Hamas or Hezbollah? And you sit here now and in just one sentence tell me CARE condemns Hamas and CARE condemns Hezbollah. I'm telling you in a very clear fashion, CARE condemns terrorist acts, whoever commits them, wherever they commit them, whenever they commit them. That's not the same thing as saying you condemn Hamas and you condemn Hezbollah. Well, I recognize that you don't like my answer to the question. The FBI uncovered a secret document that seems to answer this and many other questions. This is believed to be the manifesto of the Muslim Brotherhood in North America. Hamas grew out of the Muslim Brotherhood. Palestinian Islamic Jihad grew out of the Muslim Brotherhood. From the Egyptian Islamic Jihad movement grew the current movement of Al-Qaeda, for instance. This 15-page manifesto outlines the goals and strategies of the Muslim Brotherhood's activities in North America. On page 7, the document states that their work in America is a kind of a grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within. And then it speaks about setting up groups and mosques and Islamic centers to achieve their ultimate goal, which is to destroy the miserable houses of the West so that they will be expelled and that Allah's religion is made victorious over all other religions. And at the end of the document, it lists the organizations that can help in carrying out these goals. Not only are many of these groups still in existence today, but they are the very groups who are thought to be the modern Muslim leadership of America. These are the groups like the MSA, ISNA, and notably the IEP. And where does CARE fit into all of this? In 1994, CARE was established by three of the leaders from the IEP. And it's well documented that the IEP was essentially a front group for Hamas. So perhaps that would explain why CARE won't condemn terror groups like Hamas, and also why they avoided participating in my Muslims Against Terror rally in 2004. In keeping with the goals of the document, many so-called moderate Muslim leaders have been caught on tape calling on America to become a Muslim country. We have a chance in America to be a moral leadership of America. The problem is when it will happen, it will happen, and Alhamdulillah, I have no doubt in my mind. It depends on me and you. Either we do it now, or we do it after 100 years. But this country will become an Muslim country. Before Allah opened our eyes for the last time, you will be a sample for being the second largest religion in America, and where we are now. The Islam is coming to America not through violence. It's coming to America the same way Christianity came to Rome. You've got Imam Abdul Musa, who is known as an influential speaker in the Muslim community around the world. Allah says that Islam will rise to its proper position in the world, whether these mushriks, whether these munafiks, 
whether these criminals, whether these vile mean, all of them, whether they get together, still Islam will reign supreme, whether they like it or not. Are you starting to see a pattern here? The leaders of radical Islam, or many of them, realize that they cannot win the United States at the military level. So they plot another thing or another plot to infiltrate America from within. <laughs> The prison population, I think, is generally very, very fertile ground uh, for the recruitment of uh, these extremists. The more political Islam, the more extreme forms of Islam, I've been watching that phenomena for 30 years. I knew what was happening in the prisons for years, right? And I knew that nobody else was really watching. I mean, just as a rule, everybody has been sleeping. And then no one's paid attention to the Islamic activists that have fed off the discontent of the young black males in the prison. In fact, the uh, former chaplain of the New York Department of Corrections has been caught on tape saying some extremely radical things. Brothers, be prepared to fight, be prepared to die, be prepared to kill. It's a part of the deed, and this ain't your brother just saying this, this is history, this is Quran, nobody can deny it. Islamic chaplains that go in and out of the prisons across the country, let's assume that most are decent, law-abiding American citizens who pay their taxes. Then you got a few who are on some more extreme stuff. You think that, uh, you think that there's no charity going on? It's called the other half. Read it in the 56th story of Quran. There's no uh, lack of translation, there's no mistranslation. There's no one shape, there's one thing. No, it's very clear. When you fight, you strike terror into the, into the heart of the disbelief. There is virtually no uh, attempt being made to prevent radical imams from addressing a literally captive audience and turning them into radical Islamists. And these aren't necessarily Muslims. These are people who are converted in prison. About 18% at last count of uh, prisoners in New York State are um, Islamic. The narrative of radical Islam would appeal to anybody locked up anywhere who feels that he has been unjustly treated by society. What's important to note is that barring some other kinds of interventions in the prisons, this will grow. This will grow. We're seeing thousands of inmates convert to Islam while they're in prison every year. And many of them, when they leave, go to religious communities like Islamburg. Not many people know this. For example, in upstate New York, there's a small community that, uh, on the face of it, appears to be a faithful group of devotional Muslims. But when you look into it, you'll find a lot of very concerning activities going on there. I was up there, and on the far east perimeter, you can see buses, like uh, school buses and vehicles uh, that are riddled with bullet marks. Islamburg is one of 30 compounds in America of an organization called Jamaat al fukra This organization actually has over 3,000 members and is made up mostly of individuals that converted to Islam while they were in American prisons. What is Islamburg? Is there two faces? Is it a goodwill face to show the community and then a, uh, a second backdoor face? And that's, that's really what what my concerns are. You hear gunfire when you go past there, um, you know, at night. You do hear people screaming and yelling. And there has been people that have left the compound that have told us information uh, about some of the stuff that they've done. What's most concerning to me is that these compounds are actually run by an individual by the name of Sheikh Jalani. And Jamaat al-Fukra is actually an organization out of Pakistan which has been connected to a number of terrorist activities. Jelani is tied to dozens of crimes across this country, firebombings and assassinations. 
In keeping with the deceptive nature of these groups, Sheikh Jalani produced a video which is intended to paint himself and his groups in a positive light. The American Muslims are better off in America than anywhere else, and they will never do anything wrong against their country. That is my direct to you and to them. But authorities have uncovered another video by Jalani. And this one was never intended to be seen by the public. See, film and uh, see how, you know, struggle against oppression has to be carried on. This video shows terror training, ambush tactics, and how to make bombs. Don't make any copy of this film so that it may not fall in the hands of the enemies of Islam and it can be you know, quite serious. And one has to wonder, is this what Jelani's followers are learning here in the compounds in America? We, have, we are not given any authorization of anything that you have filmed today. We're not given any authorization for that to be publicized whatsoever. Well, uh, legally, we are not. That is the law. It's a, well, you have to, the, you have to ask permission. So I'm Can, not on your property. I'm on the public road here. I know the FBI and Homeland Security are monitoring groups like Al Fukra very closely, but it's amazing to me that the story just hasn't gotten out and the media hasn't even begun to uncover what's being taught in these compounds and where Muslims like this get their ideas. And uh, the only way we're going to win this war is to begin to uncover groups like Al Fukra. We've already seen in Europe a number of severe terror attacks. The explosion blew the top deck apart, the roof was sheared off. And many other attacks have been thwarted by their authorities. You're looking at an attempted suicide bomb attack, not in Iraq, but Glasgow Airport. What we're seeing in Europe are both the cultural and violent jihad strategies at play, which is why many believe Europe is on the verge of a breakdown. Britain is in a state of denial, as is much of Europe, uh, and to a certain extent America too. A state of denial about the nature and extent, but particularly the nature of the threats that we're up against. A recent survey of Muslims shows that 30% would rather live under Sharia law than democracy. 28% would like to see Great Britain become an Islamic state. And an overwhelming majority, 81%, consider themselves Muslim first and British second very significant proportion of British Muslims do not accept the terms of settlement accepted by all other immigrant communities, which is that when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Uh, when in Britain, you observe British law. You don't expect British law to change to accommodate Islamic law. Uh, on the contrary, they do expect British law to change to accommodate Sharia law, and that is the big difference. Rather than the Muslims adopting British values, why you not adopt our values? Why you believe that the British values are superior over the, over the um, Islamic values? This creeping Sharia is the biggest threat uh, to Western freedom. These small incremental concessions that you make for so-called multicultural reasons are regarded by the other side as enormous victories. And piglet on your desk is no longer acceptable. <laughs> And the Burger King ice cream swirl is no longer acceptable. And the shirt that the Milan football club wears when it plays games is no longer acceptable. I think those kind of concessions, the concessions made uh, in the Danish cartoon case, uh, they all go the same way. A non-Muslim exercises his right of freedom of expression. He does something that would be regarded as perfectly normal. And the Muslims object. Those objections are often accompanied by death threats, vandalism, and oftentimes event actual deaths too. 
how does the state react? The state generally reacts the same way by regretting uh, that the original non-Muslims ever did anything in the first place and calling for us to all be more considerate about where we draw the line. Across the Arab world, there's been outrage at the publication of cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. The Prime Minister of Denmark has appeared on Arab television in a desperate attempt to calm the situation. It's all very moderate, moderate, moderate. But what it means is that you're drawing the line tighter and tighter and tighter round your own freedom of expression. There is another factor in the Islamists' favour, which is sheer demographic weight of numbers. Um, there are now many millions of Muslims in Britain and Europe. Do you know which name is more popular right now in Great Britain? George or Mohammed? George? Uh, Wrong. No, it's Mohammed. Most of the countries in Western Europe are in the process of becoming Muslim-majority countries. The proportion of Muslims in the population is increasing steadily. People say, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, only 10% of the population of France is Muslim. What's the big deal? It's going to be centuries before this ever, any of this ever happens. Not true at all. If you, if you have a um, population where 90% of the population have, say, 1.4 children, and 10% of the population uh, have, uh, have, have 3.8 children, then that 10% will have caught up with the 90%. It happens very, very fast, and it's happening very fast. There are now many millions of Muslims in Britain and Europe. And the point about these communities is that unlike other immigrant communities, they don't wish to integrate and they don't integrate. They kind of reinforce themselves as insular communities. We believe Islam is supreme. We believe Islam will dominate. They do see uh, the fertility rate as a key element of conquest, as they put it. This is a form of subtle, subtle threat that you cannot ignore it. It grows gradually, and the moment you recognize its existence, it's like cancer. The moment you recognize its symptoms, it's usually too late. Europe, I think, is already a lost cause. And as time goes on, America will be endangered. You know, many have said that, well, American Muslims are much more assimilated and we don't have as much of a problem. I think that we're just a little behind where Europe has already gotten to. One shouldn't discount the possibility of absolutely horrible, destructive uh, terrorism. This has always been the nightmare scenario. Most people thought the risk of a massive explosion caused by a nuclear device went away with the Cold War. But according to the head of MI5 today, it remains a possibility. The risk is that a group like Al-Qaeda could get hold of chemical, biological, radiological or nuclear devices, or as they're known in the intelligence community, CBRN. Our nightmare scenario is a, a nuclear uh, detonation. And you know, the second uh, down, the second rung from that, you might say, is a, a dirty bomb. A dirty bomb is essentially a core of radioactive material wrapped around with conventional explosives or perhaps even laced with a chemical or a biological weapons uh, agent. A bomb like that going off in the heart of downtown New York City, downtown uh, Washington, D.C., 
um, certainly would be a devastating occurrence. With a dirty bomb, once the bomb goes off, um, you're just starting out because when you deal with the casualties and the damage, then you have to ask, what is the unseen damage? What's the level of radiation? Uh, is this uh, something that people are going to die from? Over what kind of area? How far do you have to evacuate? What are your wind directions? When will, when will you be able to repopulate that area? And even if you would judge that it's, that it's safe to, um, to come back to, who will be confident or comfortable being the first ones to come back there? Getting access in this uh, global marketplace to weapons of mass destruction uh, becomes easier every day and uh, understand that this is a group of, of individuals, if they had access to them, wouldn't hesitate for a nanosecond not to use them. Just days ago, these men were arrested with 30 kilos of radioactive material. Thai authorities believe they were preparing a dirty bomb with cesium. Perhaps the only thing more devastating than a dirty bomb is a nuclear device. And today, a nuclear device can fit into a suitcase. A terrorist needs no more than 60 kilograms of highly enriched uranium to make a simple nuclear suitcase bomb. Put simply, two balls of uranium are sealed at each end of a tube, they're smashed together. The explosion is as powerful as the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. We know after the fall of the, uh, the Soviet Union that uh, there are just a lot of um, nuclear material, or indeed nuclear weapons, that are not fully accounted for. It's been documented that Al-Qaeda on more than one occasion has sought to buy uh, nuclear material. In the second interview that Osama bin Laden did with ABC News on Christmas Eve of 1998, the question was asked, do you have uh, these weapons and would you use them? And his answer was, we consider it, that would be Al-Qaeda, a religious duty to acquire these weapons and to use them as we see fit. If I seek to acquire such weapons, this is a religious duty. How we use them is up to us. The radical Islamists would not uh, at all uh, hesitate to try to use, uh, if they had it, a nuclear weapon or biological weapons to, say, decapitate the American government. And for Americans to believe that it is impossible for a mushroom cloud to appear in Manhattan, or in LA, or in San Antonio, or Minneapolis, St. Paul, they're sorely mistaken. Iran provides a new and I think extremely alarming phenomenon. <laughs> What makes this particularly important and dangerous is the possession of nuclear weapons. Now, we don't know whether Iran has or hasn't nuclear weapons, but they're certainly making every effort to acquire them. And my guess is that they either have some already or will have them within a very short time. <laughs> از همه ظرفیت هسته‌ای رو به پایان است و با و ما نزدیکی‌های قله هستیم مقاومت‌های دشمنان در حال تضعیف شدن و ضعیف‌تر شدن است We need to understand what's been happening in Iran over the past 30 years Ever since 1979 when Ayatollah Khomeini came to power in Iran and established his theocracy he didn't just establish a tyranny in Iran, he declared war against the West. He declared his intention to Islamize the West, to subjugate the West to Islam. Very few people at the time took that seriously. The followers of Ayatollah Khomeini shocked the world by taking over an American embassy and holding our State Department employees hostage for 444 days. And what that was, was a statement against the West, a statement against America, and making it clear to their population and to all the Islamists of the world that theocratic Islamism stood against American liberty and Western freedom. We know that the Iranian government is working uh, very hard to uh, develop a nuclear weapons program as well as other kinds of uh, weapons of mass destruction programs. Iran's nuclear program is thought to be spread over at least 50 sites. They could, at least in theory, 
enriched uranium to 90%, weapons grade, requiring some 2,000 centrifuges spinning to supersonic speeds. قدرت آمریکا رو به ازمهلال است قدرت پوشالی و سلطه شیطانی آمریکا بر جهان رو به نابودی I would regard this as a real danger at the present time the acquisition of nuclear weapons and their control by Ahmadinejad During the Cold War both sides, the United States and the Soviet Union, had nuclear weapons. But they didn't use them because of what we knew as MAD, M-A-D, Mutual Assured Destruction. Each side knew that if they used a nuclear weapon, the other would respond in kind and everybody would be destroyed. M-A-D won't work with uh, Ahmadinejad um, because Mutual Assured Destruction, for one of his mindset, is not a deterrent, it's an incentive. Um, it, this is the final struggle, the end of time. It doesn't matter if you kill billions of your own people. Allah will know his own, and you will be doing them a favor by giving them a quick pass to heaven and all its delights. Um, that's why I feel that if he has it, or when he has it, to be more precise, he will not hesitate to use it. The peak, the pinnacle, the crest, the highest point, the pivot, the summit of Islam is jihad. This is our intention, brothers and sisters, that we want to have children and offer them as soldiers defending Islam put in their soft, tender heart the zeal of jihad and the love of shahada, the love of martyrdom. Nan alhamdulillah musulmanam dasigat asbab idakra la chpidai amaliyat stadzwanan uzanun atayarkra. We have to realize that we're facing a massive clash of values. This six-year-old sent by the Taliban to suicide bomb a police station Yes, we want to give children a military education. We want to train them against cruel invaders and infidels. So if we need them, they will join this struggle. We want to use children to behead infidels and spies, so they will become brave. One week a home video showed up on the internet with children acting out a beheading scene. Later, a video clip from Pakistan showed a 12-year-old doing it for real, beheading a traitor to the Taliban. Even kids' entertainment is laced with Islamist propaganda. They use characters that look like Mickey Mouse to teach eventual Islamic domination over the world. You also get a puppet show where a small boy tells President George Bush that the White House would become a mosque. And more and more, we're seeing mothers whose highest aspiration is to send their children on jihad missions to die as martyrs. Farahat has sent three of her sons on suicide missions. That's why her supporters call her Umm Nadal, the mother of the struggle. Umm Nadal, the lady who presented her children to the people of the people. I told these children to the people of the people of سواء بعمليات سواء بأي شيء ممكن إنهم يجاهدوا حضرتك عندك عشرة من الأبناء آه الحمد لله آه يعني آه إنه إنه حد تاني كمان يغتال أو 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 في, طبعا أو في موقع يذهب ولا ولا قلبك يعني امتلأ بالأحزان ما تقدريش تستحملي حاجة زي كده لا لا الحمد لله إحنا مهيئين نفسنا بقول لك أنا أنا كل شيء أنا يعني إيه مضحية بالجميع آه. إذا كان يعني الواجب يعني 
بستدعي اني اقدمهم كلهم والله لن ابخل حتى لو كانوا 100 ولد when you have muslims who are willing to kill their own children for um, political advantages wrap bomb on them and send them out if you can kill your own children what prevents you of killing my children or prevents you killing millions of children of other people the muslim rebels in chechnya that attacked captured a school full of children and then proceeded to slaughter the children when faced with a certain death themselves is a perfect example of what exactly will take place in this country. Many families in Beslan are suffering the cruelest form of bereavement, the violent deaths of their children. The real war is not a war against a bunch of terrorists. It's a war between the values of freedom and democracy and the values of barbarism. This is the real war that's happening now. This is a determined and a radical enemy. We are in a battle for the very civilization and way of life that we believe in. If we are not willing to recognize it as a battle for our civilization, then we may as well give up right now. Islamism is like cancer. You either defeat it or it will defeat you. The battleground is the battleground of ideas and ideology. The West hasn't even entered this battleground. It hasn't even understood there is this battleground where it must enter. If I'm asked to sum up my message to America at the present time, I would sum it up in two words, wake up. Spending time with my family, being here, this, this is what it's all about. And, and, and this is what's at stake, our freedoms, our, our liberties. but there are things we need to do. We've got to get involved and be part of the solution. We have to educate ourselves and others. We need to find an alternative to oil and stop supporting the petrodollar spread of radical Islam. We must insist the media tells the full story. We must demand an end to the incitement of children and demand human rights and freedom for the citizens of Islamic countries. We must ask that Muslims and their leaders take a stand against Sharia replacing Western law. And we have to support leaders that stand up to radical Islam. We will win this if enough people stand up for the American freedoms and liberties that our forefathers fought to create.